We are ready. Okay, if everybody's ready while we uh, get started. Is this on? If everybody's ready, uh, I'll, I was about to say we'll get started, but I guess really it's I'll get started. Uh, feel a little lonely up here. If anybody wants to come sit up here, you can feel free to join me. Uh, my name is Don Enright. I'm a partner with the law firm of Levy and Korzynski. Uh, uh, we're a medium-sized firm with offices in uh, New York, D.C., Connecticut, and California. And uh, I've been doing uh, securities litigation and uh, corporate governance litigation for nearly 26 years. Uh, first with a D.C. law firm called uh, uh, Finkelstein Thompson, and uh, for the last 12 years with uh, uh, Levine Korzynski. Uh, for the past 15 years or so, most of my uh, my work has revolved around corporate governance litigation relating to mergers and acquisitions and uh, refinancings, uh, things of that nature involving uh, fairly well-established uh, law uh, involving uh, primarily uh, Delaware law, a lot of chancery court litigation. But about, uh, I guess it was about four years ago, uh, I just sort of got roped into uh, starting to work on a number of cryptocurrency cases, and uh, they absorbed a lot of my time for the last four or five years. Uh, and uh, there's some, I think, fairly valuable lessons uh, to be uh, learned from that from people who are practicing in, uh, in uh, Financial litigation generally, and specifically in uh, class action litigation. Uh, the first uh, question, really, uh, I suppose, is what is a cryptocurrency? Uh, I can tell you that uh, before I started working on uh, this stuff, uh, I had heard of Bitcoin and uh, maybe Ethereum. Uh, that was about it. I, I didn't really know what they were, what they did, how, uh, how they operated, what, what functions they served, uh, or what the, the legal implications were of uh, the buying and selling and creation of, uh, of cryptocurrencies. Um, I had a pretty uh, fast crash course in it. Uh, luckily, I had some very smart young associates who were a little bit more savvy than I was at the start, and they helped bring me to speed. So the first question, as I said, is what is a cryptocurrency? Uh, again, it's something that you hear spoken about a lot, but uh, a lot, I think a lot of people don't really know because of what it is. And it's, it, really, it's an encrypted data string that denotes a unit of the specific token or coin or currency. Um, and it's uh, monitored and uh, organized on a peer-to-peer -peer network called a blockchain, uh, which serves as a secure ledger uh, of transactions. And it's, it's a, uh, a disseminated uh, ledger, which isn't all in the hands of one central authority. Rather, <coughs> it's, it's a... Uh, a broad-based network of many, many computers where the ledger is, is kept by all of them, and wh whichever ledger is maintained by the majority of those network hubs, um, that becomes the official uh, um, record of the transactions, which is known as a blockchain. So for a cryptocurrency holder to buy or sell uh, or transfer a cryptocurrency, uh, the miners solve the digital formulas that uh, are necessary to conduct the transaction. Uh, and the verification that that transaction has been completed is known as a block. And it's distributed within the network uh, as part of the blockchain, uh, which again is the public record of all the cryptocurrencies transactions. And the, this process incentivizes the miners uh, who run the network with, crypto, uh, with the cryptocurrency itself. So, uh, people who run these uh, these data nodes are rewarded for uh, their hardware's work in, in managing these transactions by getting uh, a little piece of the cryptocurrency in question uh, for the use of their hardware. Now, you may have heard of, uh, of at least Bitcoin and Ethereum, uh, which are far and away the, uh, the largest uh, 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 cryptocurrencies by uh, uh, by market capitalization, if you want to call it that, total uh, uh, market value. Um, 
but uh, there's dozens, maybe even hundreds of others. Uh, uh, the, the other uh, of the top five in terms of market capitalization are uh, Tether, uh, BNB, and USD coin. Uh, but they are much, much smaller in terms of the aggregate value of the market. So Bitcoin, as of a few days ago when I, when I pulled this data, had a, uh, a total market value of over $800 billion, uh, which is sort of stunning when you think about it. Uh, Ethereum is close to $400 billion. Tether, uh, BNB, and USD coins are all somewhere between $50 and $80 billion, so much, much smaller than the two big boys, Bitcoin and Ethereum. And then when you work down the list, there are some with a total market cap of you know, under a dollar, uh, where those coins or tokens just never caught on for whatever reason. So first, let's uh, talk a little bit more about what was a blockchain. Uh, again, as I noted, it's supported by thousands of computers. Uh, so there is no central authority. It's, it's dist uh, distributed. And uh, it, this reportedly guarantees the fidelity and security of the record data. Uh, and generates trust uh, without the need for, for a specific third party, which is particularly useful for cross-border transactions where you don't need uh, um, letters of credit and things like that in order to, uh, to uh, complete uh, uh, cross-border international transactions. And as I noted, the blockchain uh, uh, collects uh, the data packets for transactions uh, together in groups, which are known as blocks, and which are then added to the block chain. Now, each block has a certain storage capacity, and when it's filled, that block is closed, and that's when it gets added to the chain. And all new information that follows that freshly added block is, is compiled into the next block, which once filled will then be added to the chain. Now, there are several advantages uh, to blockchain technology that are sort of aspirational uh, as uh, far as what this technology may be able to accomplish for human society going forward. And the first is uh, accuracy of the chain. As I mentioned, because this is a distributed uh, network uh, without one central authority, uh, it's uh, considered to be very secure uh, because it, it, it would be very, very difficult to alter the blockchain because there's so many nodes that would have to be altered. Uh, and there's uh, purported cost reductions uh, uh, such as bank fees uh, uh, or uh, currency exchange fees, uh, uh, documentation fees associated with uh, you know, notarization and execution of, of, uh, of documents, things of those nature. All those can be essentially eliminated uh, through cryptocurrency transactions um, because, again, uh, the blockchain eliminates the need for a third party verification. Uh, for example, business owners uh, incur a small fee whenever they accept payments using credit cards um, uh, because the banks and the, the payment processing companies have to process those transactions. Uh, and whereas most cryptocurrencies attempt to limit those kind of fees. Now, uh, there's also uh, reportedly time uh, efficiencies that are achieved through blockchain and use of cryptocurrencies uh, for, for transactions, uh, where, for example, uh, if you attempt to uh, deposit a check on a Friday evening, uh, you may not actually see the, the funds until Monday morning or even later, depending on how long it takes for that to clear. The larger the check, typically, the larger, larger, longer it will take to clear. Um, and whereas financial institutions only operate five days a week, the blockchain is operating 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. So transactions can be completed in as little as 10 minutes uh, and can be considered secure after just a few hours. Uh, once you know that, that uh, transaction has been recorded in the block, that block has been added to the blockchain and it's been disseminated through the network, uh, that is essentially written in stone at that point. It can't really uh, be cha changed and the, the transfer is uh, complete and secure. Uh, and then in terms of uh, transaction recordation, many black blockchain networks uh, operate as public databases, uh, meaning that anyone with an internet connection can view a list of the network's transaction history. Um, 
But although you can, uh, you can see the transaction details, they can't access the identifying information about the actual people or entities that are making those transactions. Instead, uh, uh, it, uh, there's a unique call out called the public key that, uh, that users have, which is confidential. It's not quite anonymous uh, because uh, there, there may be uh, people or entities who know what your public key is, but, uh, uh, but unless people uh, can identify that key to a person, uh, it's essentially uh, confidential and very difficult to actually track who's doing these transactions. And uh, the advantage of that is uh, that uh, obviously there, there is significantly higher uh, confidentiality uh, in such a transaction compared to anything involving uh, transferring funds to a bank, for example. Now, there, there are certain weaknesses in, uh, in blockchain technology uh, underlying cryptocurrencies. Uh, first off, there's the danger of blockchain manipulation. We talked a little bit about how uh, the distributed network makes it very difficult to falsify or, or hack, if you will, uh, the blockchain. But if there's a fork in, in the blockchain and there's a discrepancy that develops, whichever fork has the majority of the nodes supporting it becomes the official. If anyone were to be able to somehow gain control of a majority of the networks, uh, the network does, they would be able to, uh, to falsify uh, the blockchain. So there is some concern uh, that that is a possibility, even though it may be remote. Uh, it, there actually is some specific concern about that with Bitcoin in particular, because there are uh, four miners in uh, in China which are believed to control more than fifty percent of the network um, hubs, who would, who at least nominally could potentially. Uh, alter the blockchain uh, uh, or manipulate the blockchain for, for Bitcoin uh, if they all worked in concert. <coughs> yeah. Uh, it's essentially uh, a, a, a computer uh, uh, network hub where where the, the mathematical uh, uh, computations that are necessary to, uh, to process a transaction a transaction or to create, uh, and in the case of Bitcoin, to create a new uh, Bitcoin are, are processed. And it, so it's essentially what you're really looking at generally is enormous server farms, uh, which uh, take up tremendous amounts of number one capital expenditure to, to put in place, and number two, uh, take up an enormous amount of electricity. Uh, and one of the real concerns about uh, cryptocurrency technology is uh, the the extent of the electricity that it consumes, particularly in, uh, in times when uh, when uh, energy is at a premium, uh, as it is right now uh, due to the ongoing world events. Number one, number two, um, the the cost of electricity is going to substantially affect how uh, how many of these server farms find it profitable to operate uh, and uh, and ultimately uh, could affect the, the underlying cost of Bitcoin because the primary uh, input cost for these data miners uh, the, is electricity. So when the cost of electricity goes up, their operating costs go up, they may end up uh, imposing additional transaction fees uh, or and the underlying price of the cryptocurrencies and, Including, for example, Bitcoin may uh, be inflated as a result. Does that answer your question? All right. The, another issue uh, with, with cryptocurrencies is uh, uh, limited capacity. <clears throat> is limited capacity for exchanges uh, under the Satoshi Protocol, which is the the uh, the mining and, and transaction resolution protocol for. Uh, uh, for Bitcoin, for example, one new block is created every 10 minutes and maxes out 
at 144 blocks per day. Uh, so that, that would be uh, uh, six blocks per hour. The, the maximum size of each block is one megabyte. The average transaction size, uh, the you know, transaction record is uh, about 400 bytes. Uh, so there would be about uh, 2,250 transactions per block. So you do the math there, uh, 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 2,250 uh, blocks uh, times 144 blocks, that would be 324,000 transactions that can be processed uh, on the Bitcoin uh, blockchain per day. Now that sounds like a lot, I suppose, until you think about it in the context of a worldwide economy in which if people were trying to transact routine business uh, uh, using Bitcoin, it would simply not be feasible. For example, just think about how many at this very moment, how many people are buying a coffee or, uh, or uh, buying a magazine or, or buying a, a new entertainment center for their home at this moment in New York City alone. Uh, th that 324,000 transactions per day would be instantly overwhelmed uh, just in, you know, uh, in the United States, let alone the world, uh, if, it, uh, if, this were to, if you were trying to make, uh, if you were to try to make this the sort of default transaction mechanism. It's just not possible. Uh, so there are limitations just on the volume of transactions that, that uh, can be effectuated in any given day. And that's why, frankly, people who think that all of us are going to be transacting all of our business in Bitcoin in the future, it, the, the reality is that the, the basic fundamentals of the blockchain technology simply don't allow for it. And uh, there, there are some thoughts that you could reduce the number of bytes per transaction and get the, the transaction, uh, maximum transaction numbers per day up to perhaps close to a million uh, per day, that still would be totally uh, insufficient for you know, a global uh, economy uh, 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 transaction uh, load. Uh, so this is going to remain sort of a niche uh, mechanism for uh, facilitating transactions. Uh, slow transaction time, uh, it can be an issue with, with Bitcoin, even though it's uh, significant with most cryptocurrencies, even though, as I said, it's the blockchain is there 24-7, 365, um, uh, there is some occasions when uh, those limitations that I was just talking about could be implicated and uh, you could get congestion and things could get backed up. So it's possible uh, in uh, occasions of network congestion that things could be uh, backed up for significant periods and there's really nothing you can do about it if that's the case. Uh, and uh, such congestion could also, as I noted, uh, end up causing in increases in transaction fees. Um, it, uh, as of uh, last year, the average uh, Bitcoin transaction fee was $59. Which, if you think about it, uh, is much higher than the, the transactional cost associated with, for example, writing a check. So the, 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 the premise that, uh, that cryptocurrency uh, uh, transactions will eliminate frictional costs, transactional costs, um, is really it's sort of a misnomer. Uh, what, what it can do is limit those, particularly on large transactions, large transfers, but uh, but for smaller things, it's just, it's not feasible. Again, for that reason, you're never going to be buying a cup of coffee with, with 0 0.00001 Bitcoins. So, when, once you understand what a cryptocurrency is and, you know, what sort of roles it, it plays in society, the question becomes, well, what is it? How is it regulated? What laws apply to it? Uh, and there's a pretty fair amount of, of discussion and analysis that's been going on in this for the past decade. Uh, and it really varies from cryptocurrency to cryptocurrency, from coin to coin, from token to token. And it really depends on 
how the cryptocurrency was created, who created it, how they marketed it, what it purports to be for, uh, who uses it, uh, and who buys it. Uh, and the, the, the first question uh, is, well, uh, is it secure? Because obviously uh, securities have a very, very well developed uh, series of statutes and regulations in the United States which govern how they're created, how they're disseminated, how they're traded. Uh, and if a cryptocurrency is a security, then it has all sorts of implications for how it's going to be regulated, who can make it, how they can issue it, how they can disseminate it, uh, and even who can buy it. And the, uh, the first touchstone for determining if any financial instrument is a, uh, is a security is uh, the Howey in the, in the Hills test. Uh, which uh, goes back to a uh, 1946 uh, United States Supreme Court decision uh, from SEC versus W.J. Howey Company, which did business as Howey in the Hills. Uh, and uh, it was uh, sort of the, the seminal case in determining how any uh, financial instrument is classified as whether it's a security or not. Um, and uh, the, the key test is called the investment contract test, and, and we'll get into that in, in a moment. Uh, going back to 1946, the Howey uh, company sold tracts of citrus groves to buyers in Florida who would then lease back the land uh, to Howey, uh, who would then operate the groves and sell the fruit on behalf of the owners. Uh, and then there was a revenue sharing scheme. And uh, most buyers had no experience in purchasing, running, or operating orange groves, uh, and they were not required to tend the land themselves. They had no actual role in the operation of these groves. But uh, Howie Company failed to register the, uh, these grove interests as uh, securities with the, the SEC, and the SEC intervened uh, when people started complaining. Uh, and this went all the way up to the Supreme Court, and the court's final uh, ruling uh, determined that the leaseback arrangements were, in fact, securities, even though nobody called it a stock or a bond or a debenture or anything like that. These interests in these uh, these orange groves uh, was a security. And again, uh, the way that the Supreme Court made this determination is through the investment contract test that was applied, and. Uh, and uh, that's the Howey test that's listed here. And security is an investment of money in a common enterprise with the expectation of profit to be derived from the efforts of others. And in the case of Howey, uh, the buyers uh, of the citrus groves saw the transactions as primarily valuable because they expected to make money from the operation of the groves and they invested uh, money to obtain that interest in that common enterprise with the expectation of a profit. And again, the Howie Company was operating the, uh, the groves, so uh, they, uh, uh, it was through the, uh, the efforts of others, so that investment contract test was satisfied in that case. Fast forward 80 years or 70 years, and, uh, and that same test is being applied today to, to cryptocurrencies. Now, early SEC uh, analysis concerning cryptocurrency focused first on the risks associated with, with investing in crypto. Uh, in 2013, the SEC Office of Investor Advocacy uh, issued an investor uh, alert entitled Ponzi Schemes Using Virtual Currencies to warn individual investors about fraudulent investment schemes uh, involving cryptocurrencies. And then on, uh, in 2014, uh, the Office of Investor Education and Advocacy issued uh, another investor alert entitled uh, Bitcoin and Other Virtual Currency Related Investments to make investors aware of the potential risks of investments involving Bitcoin and other forms of virtual currency. But nothing had been determined yet at this point that any of these things were actually securities. So uh, 
as more and more of these uh, new cryptocurrencies were being issued uh, and sold in what was what are called ICOs, initial coin op offerings, uh, the SEC started spinning up their uh, their resources to, to address it. And in 2017, uh, they conducted an investigation and published a report called uh, Investigation Pursuant to Section 21A of the Securities Exchange Act of 1934 regarding the DAO, the DAO. I'm going to call that the DAO. Uh, in this report, the SEC applied the Howey test. Uh, and in applying that test, the SEC cited the proposition that form should be disregarded for substance and the emphasis should be on economic realities underlying a transaction and not on the name appended there too. So again, it doesn't matter if it's called a currency, doesn't matter if it's called a coin or a token uh, or an orange grove. Uh, if it meets those Howey test uh, criteria, it's gonna be treated as a security. And the SEC reasoned that, uh, that DAO investors use Ethereum to make their investments. Uh, and by the way, just, just to take a step back, many times the uh, initial investments in these ICOs is not in the form of dollars. Most of the time, it's in the form of other cryptocurrencies, primarily Bitcoin or Ethereum. Uh, in, in the DAO, uh, it, uh, it was Ethereum. And it, uh, Ethereum is very effective for this type of transaction because the smart contract that uh, that is attached to the Ethereum blockchain allows people to uh, to effectuate an exchange for a new uh, uh, cryptocurrency sort of automatically uh, without uh, without going through any uh, uh, paperwork or anything like that. You click on a link, you put in your uh, your key number. Uh, you can fill out the, the number that you want to exchange, and you can just do it all essentially on one computer screen. Uh, so, uh, so Ethereum is very frequently used for uh, for these investments in, in these ICO uh, offerings. Pardon me, one moment. I should have done this before we got started. Is everybody riveted by all this stuff so far? Okay. So uh, first, the, uh, the SEC looked at um, the fact that investors in the, the Dow were uh, buying it with Ethereum. And as you may recall, that the first test in the Howey test is, is there an investment of money? And so the question is, uh, is Ethereum money? Uh, and the answer is yeah. Uh, they, uh, they, they considered that to be because Ethereum has a known value, a, a quoted value. Uh, it's clearly a, a, an item of, uh, of worth and therefore its investment uh, is considered a investment of money. Uh, second, the, uh, the SEC looked in the Dow report at the second and third Howey test elements, which is, is there a common enterprise and, and is there an expectation of profit? And for that, you really look at how the, the Dow is run and how it's marketed and who's buying it and who's buying it. Can I just ask Sure. How does the Dow relate to the cryptocurrency definition Okay, so the DAO is another one of these cryptocurrencies that was initially uh, being offered in 2016, I want to say, uh, that uh, they, they offer these new ICOs, they come up with some uh, angle of, oh, we're going to use this, uh, this new cryptocurrency for this special kind of blockchain. And they're often sort of faddish. Oh, this is going to be uh, one of the, one of the cases I worked on involving a company called Paragon. Uh, it was all about the cannabis industry. They're going to, to have their this entire blockchain uh, for for Paragon coins devoted to the cannabis industry. You know, uh, at the time, uh, the so cannabis. So the DAO, just so I understand uh -huh. what the SEC is talking about. Sure. I'm confused. 
if you're using blockchain to do a transaction with a vendor of yours in a foreign country, it would seem more like a platform. But if you are in a currency, but you're the DAO means you're investing in, for example, the cannabis company. So, so as it turns out, uh, yeah. the vast majority of these coins uh, are not bought in order to conduct business or transactions. Okay, mm -hmm. the vast majority of these are not actually used, uh, being purchased in order to be used as a unit of exchange. The vast majority of cryptocurrencies are being purchased uh, by speculators in the hope and expectation that it will increase in value and that they will profit their money. Okay. Uh, now, the, the fact that these things can be used uh, to conduct uh, tr uh, transactions and uh, to conduct business is at least not only the basis for the underlying value, uh, but again, I, I would say that's not only only in the vast majority of cases. In, in reality, most of these uh, initial coin offerings are, are marketed to people uh, in the expectation that people will buy it and then hold on to it, and it'll become worth more, and they'll profit thereby. And uh, any of you who, who follow the cryptocurrency markets at all, um, it, there's a lot of um, of internet chit chat about it on, on millions of uh, message boards and chat rooms, what have you, uh, where uh, enthusiasts for, for these different coins or tokens vociferously encourage each other to buy it, buy more, and hold it. And uh, they, uh, there's a, uh, an internet meme, if you will, that's associated with it, this line of thinking is, hold it, H-O-D-L, and that's hold on for dear life. Uh, because all of these, uh, these cryptocurrencies, uh, all the way up to and including um, uh, Bitcoin, are extremely volatile in, in their value at any given day. It's not unusual for Bitcoin to lose 5% uh, or gain 5% of its value in a day. And then the next day uh, to have another 5% up or down. And, uh, whereas it's for a, you know, a routine stock on you know, the NASDAQ or the New York Stock Exchange, for a company, uh, for a stock to gain or lose 5% of its value in a day, typically you would expect there, uh, there to have been some market moving event involving that company in that day. Uh, they, they announced they're restating their earnings, or they got a massive new contract with the US government, or there's a rumor that, uh, that some huge uh, 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 private equity group or, uh, or competitor is thinking about acquiring them. That's the sort of thing that, that you would normally expect to see in conjunction with a stock moving 5% any given day. For, uh, for cryptocurrencies, they'll move 5 or 10% in a day for no apparent reason. Uh, so uh, that volatility, uh, yeah. Oh, sorry, this is a really basic question, but what, what gives any of the cryptocurrencies their value aside from the enthusiasm? Okay, number one, uh, the, I would say that nominally the ability to transact business, as I said, through the through the through the blockchain. That's nominal. The reality is, as I said, this is almost entirely comprised of, of speculation, uh, and consequently, and, and that total mentality. So, nominally, it, it's that underlying ability to transact business. But again, that, that volatility really makes these cryptocurrencies sort of a, a, a poor medium to conduct, to conduct business because you don't know what it's, uh, what it's gonna be worth the next day after your transaction. But uh, so honestly, and uh, there are a lot of cryptocurrency experts out there who would probably disagree with me on this. What, what makes it uh, uh, worth, worth what it's worth? Uh, the, specula the, the speculative market, what people think it's worth. At any given moment, and and again, it really comes back to that <clears throat> that enthusiasm. Uh, and if it, and if it had real fundamentals underpinning it that could be measured, and if you could somehow value Bitcoin based on a uh, 
a discounted cash flow analysis or something like that, uh, that would sort of anchor what it what it's worth, and it would sort of, you know, it, it might uh, bounce around that number, you know, within a standard deviation or so. It would it would be sort of anchored around that value as stocks are in general, uh, but there's nothing anchoring the price of the crypto. So again, uh, just coming back to the to the Dow report. Yeah, sure. Follow up question: Is there an unlimited amount of cryptocurrency, or is it limited? No, it's limited. Well, it, it varies from coin to coin. Um, some of them, I would say, with essentially all of them, they are at least nominally limited. Um, Bitcoin, for example, definitely has a limited number uh, of coins, and to create more, they have to mine them. Uh, which takes a, a significant uh, investment of computing power. Uh, uh, more or less, is, uh, the same is true of Ethereum. Uh, most of the other uh, ICOs, the, the, the coins are just created out of whole cloth by the company and either sold or distributed through what they call a faucet, where people can, if they click so many times on something, they can get you know some fraction of a coin. There, there's a lot of different ways that they can uh, try to disseminate it. Uh, most often, it's just by selling. Uh, hey, we got this new coin. If you want some, buy it. We're gonna we're gonna sell it at this price, uh, and then uh, uh, in six weeks we're gonna increase the price, and then six weeks after that we're gonna increase the price again. And they try to create upward uh, uh, value trajectory that way. Uh, but what but turns out when they do it that way, and when they're selling it rather than distributing it and trying to create a marketplace. Uh, uh, by just kind of giving it away and then letting people trade it back and forth. When they start out by selling it, that looks an awful lot like uh, like the issuance of, of or an offering of securities, and that's where uh, the SEC and, and uh, the securities laws uh, come into play. This is a, my my second question: Is when will it be allowed, or is there legislation or a push to make it part of, let's say, a, you know, a retirement account? Uh, Fidelity just opened it up. I'm sorry? Yes, Fidelity just opened up IRA investment yeah. in Bitcoin. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and uh, most securities uh, dealers now, uh, uh, if you have a, you know, an account with Ameriprise or JP Morgan, most of them now do have the ability to, uh, to uh, per, uh, purchase and sell cryptocurrencies through your regular securities account. So you don't have to dive into the the world of, of actually, uh, you know, trading through uh, one of these specialized uh, uh, cryptocurrency exchanges. You can do it through your, uh, uh, your uh, uh, brokerage, which I would actually, which I strongly suspect, although I don't have uh, uh, a real Solid grasp on I actually suspect it's more secure uh, because it's uh, it's going to be insured and uh, and you're, uh, you've got a real company uh, holding it there and uh, essentially street name so that uh, it's more resistant I would think for uh, to loss through hacking and uh, if we have time for today we'll get into a little bit about how often these small uh, uh, cryptocurrency exchanges are hacked and people get all of their holdings in it just cleaned out. Uh, I, I worked on a case involving that uh, where uh, the exchange, which was located in Italy, got hacked. Uh, and uh, in reality, it was, it, it was, turns out it was actually a problem that was embedded in the, the blockchain itself, called double, count, uh, double counting certain, certain transactions that somebody learned how to exploit. Uh, and people's just their accounts just got emptied out, uh, and losing you know, hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, at least nominally hundreds of millions of dollars worth of uh, this uh, coin. But uh, let, let's come back to you know figuring out if one of these things is, is a security. Uh, so the, the second and third tests are is our common enterprise. Um, and is there an expectation of profit? And as I said, that really kind of depends on who's selling it or who's disseminating it, uh, how they're operating uh, the blockchain, 
uh, and, and the coin dissemination, uh, and who's buying it and why. So uh, on the, in the Dow report, the SEC concluded that uh, the Dow tokens were being operated as part of a common enterprise by the, the, the developers of the DAO, uh, and that the people who bought it were led to uh, expect and, uh, and reasonably to be pursuing uh, profits by purchasing and holding uh, these DAO tokens. Uh, and profits can be a nebulous term, uh, uh, but in this instance, it, it includes dividends, uh, periodic uh, payments, or just the increased value of the underlying investment. And that's really where you end up uh, seeing it mostly with cryptocurrencies. It's an expectation. You, know, you don't generally get dividends from, from holding a cryptocurrency. What you, uh, what you can get, however, is a profit by it appreciating in value. If you uh, buy a, an Ethereum token today for, uh, call it $1,200, uh, and uh, and it goes up to fourteen hundred dollars tomorrow. You can sell it then and make a two hundred dollar profit, and th that's the expectation that underpins the, uh, this investor enthusiasm and that whole hodl mindset. The expectation of profit through appreciation. Uh, and uh, with the Dow, the SEC really looked closely at the promotional materials disseminated uh, by the founders and. Uh, uh, found that uh, the DAO was a for-profit enterprise whose objective was to fund projects in exchange for a return on the investment. The Ethereum was pooled and available to, uh, to the DAO founders to fund those projects. And, uh, and that was the common enterprise and that expectation of appreciation and value was the expectation of profit. And therefore, uh, the SEC found that the second and third test were met. Looking then at the final Howey test, you know, is this profit expected to be derived from the efforts of others? The answer is yes. These, these people who are buying DAO, they're not running the DAO. The, the founders, the, the promoters of it are the ones who are running, uh, running, operating the blockchain, et cetera. And thus the, uh, the, uh, the SEC found that it was, the fourth test was satisfied, it was, uh, that the, those profits were expected to be derived from the uh, efforts of the founders and promoters of the now. So that this this report uh, from the SEC in 2017 was sort of the uh, the seminal analysis that has influenced everything there, uh, thereafter as far as determining whether or not any given cryptocurrency is a security. And for example, it's pretty clear that Bitcoin and Ethereum are not secure. Okay, uh, the, the, uh, they're, uh, I, I think you can struggle to actually classify them as a currency, but, uh, but the, the, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission considers them to be commodities uh, and thus subject to, uh, to uh, the United States Commodities Law. But we'll get into that a little bit later. So after the SEC uh, issued this DAO report, it sort of had sent shockwaves uh, through the, the ICOs in the community and some tried to conform uh, to uh, SC requirements. Very few actually did that. The vast majority just tried to skirt it, work around it. Uh, some tried to do it simply by not selling uh, their, uh, their cryptocurrency, uh, not conducting the ICO in the United States. Um, some tried to get around it uh, through uh, that faucet uh, mechanism that I mentioned earlier, where they don't actually sell the cryptocurrency in the initial offering, and rather they give it away and then hope to sell their, the, uh, the coins that they hold back into the market that develops for it afterwards. Uh, but a lot of them just simply bolt forward, engaged in, uh, in ICOs that were pretty clearly uh, securities offerings without uh, following any of the requirements of registration or uh, or any of the other requirements uh, that uh, the SEC imposes for the offering of the security. Sure. Um, this might be a question based on my lack of understanding securities law, but from the perspective of the people that be on the DAO side, for example, 
why are they pushing back so hard to say that these should not be considered securities? Does it hinder their because, or how does that? Work? Because as soon as something is classified as a security, it, you get exposed to a wealth of regulatory requirements, which all of which have costs associated with them in terms of compliance, and also a, a wealth <laughs> of potential liability under uh, under the uh, the. Securities Act of 33, the Securities Exchange Act of 34, uh, the anti-fraud provisions uh, thereof. And so they, uh, they, you know, five years ago, the, the cryptocurrency markets were the wild, wild west. Uh, people were like, oh, we'll call it a currency, therefore it's not a security, and uh, therefore we're not subject to all that, uh, that stuff. And it, it, this Dow report in 2017 was the first time the SEC pushed back uh, push back in a sort of conclusive way, saying no, just call you call, just because you call it a currency or a coin or a token doesn't mean it's not a security. Um, and this sort of started floodgates of a, a lot of SEC litigation and a lot of private securities litigation against some of these uh, ICO uh, developers and promoters uh, regarding you know essentially, hey, you, you guys sold a security, usually by by the way, based on pretty dicey facts and, uh, and, and assertions uh, without going through the registration requirement. Uh, and, and we'll get into that in a little bit. Thank you. Sure. Um, so uh, in, uh, in, in 2018, uh, the, uh, Walt, Walter Hinnon, the director of the Division of Corporate Finance for the SEC, gave a presentation uh, at the Yahoo Finance All Market Summit, in which he noted uh, we should focused not on the digital asset itself, but on the circumstances surrounding the digital asset and the manner in which it's sold. To that end, a better line of inquiry is, can a digital asset that was originally offered in a securities offer ever be later sold in a manner that does not constitute an offering of, security, of a security? So that's where the, the question of, if it's a security when it's sold in the ICO, what are the implications for the secondary? And, and for uh, for those trading, uh, because once you end up uh, uh, having those traded on, on an exchange, if it's a security, then the exchanges that are, are trading them and the and the uh, and the, the, the entities that are acting as essentially brokers of them, all of a sudden they are required to register with the SEC as uh, as broker dealers, which again carries within a host of compliance and regulatory issues that wouldn't really be there for some nebulous coin or token. So once it gets classified as a security, uh, there are implications for the, the initial sale, the initial offering, and, as, uh, and also for the subsequent uh, afterward. Uh, then in 2019, the SEC issued a, another uh, analysis called the Framework for Investment Contract Analysis of Digital Assets. And again, that's the that's the investment contract analysis that, that was first handed down in the Howe case. Uh, unlike the SEC's earlier uh, uh, publications, uh, this uh, focused on providing an overarching framework to determine whether any given cryptocurrency is a security. So the Dow report focused pretty much exclusively on that one cryptocurrency, the Dow. Uh, the, the analysis. Uh, from 2019, the, uh, the investment contract analysis of digital assets, uh, that uh, is the SEC's <laughs> position statement on, on whether any given cryptocurrency is a uh, security. And again, it really break, breaks down to the Howey test with a focus on, again, on the, the underlying economic realities rather than, uh, than form over substance. Uh, Let me just check on our time situation here. It looks like I've got about 12 minutes left. So I'm going to uh, skip forward a little, a little bit more. So once uh, you end up having this Dow report come down in 2017, um, a lot of people who have lost money in some of these highly speculative, uh, some might even say shady uh, ICO, uh, 
offerings that had uh, taken place in the preceding couple of years, uh, they started saying, hey, I got ripped off. And uh, this ICO, that this was uh, a security and uh, I want my money. Uh, and uh, private litigation started uh, cropping up uh, sort of immediately in the wake of the issues of the Dow report. Um, my firm being a, an enterprising, uh, profit-driven entity, we, uh, we got in on it. And, uh, and we started uh, bringing uh, uh, ICO uh, class actions on behalf of investors. Um, one of the first cases in which a United States District Court found that, uh, that an ICO offering was, in fact, an, offering of, uh, of an unregistered offering of securities was the ATV coin case uh, from the Southern District of New York, in which I was uh, not coincidentally the counsel. Uh, and again, the court uh, applied the, the Howey test and found that, in fact, uh, the, the founders uh, were uh, engaged in, in, in an offering of securities without uh, the register. Now, so. When they look at this, again, they really look at how did they market this? Uh, first, did they, did they sell these or did they just sort of disseminate them? Because if you just disseminate them without any money coming back to you through that FOSS, FOSS mechanism I mentioned earlier, it's kind of hard to, um, to argue that it's uh, a securities offer because you're not actually getting any money directly from it. But if you sell it, which ATB Coin did, um, that makes it start to look like an investment. And then uh, once you have that, then they look at, well, how did they market it? And, uh, and again, uh, in ATB, they marketed it as, we've got this great uh, blockchain that we are going to be operating that's going to have all these beneficial effects, and we are running it, and you can, uh, can buy uh, some of these coins and uh, expect that they will appreciate in value because this underlying blockchain is going to be so efficient and so great. And uh, so people, they invest money in a common enterprise with an expectation of profit based on um, uh, the work that was to be done on this blockchain technology by the founders. It was a security. Uh, the, uh, unfortunately, the founders of this com uh, company essentially have uh, disappeared. Uh, and uh, establishing liability against them is going to be difficult. Turns out, um, just as a practical matter, from a litigation standpoint, uh, um, from the perspective of somebody trying to recover money for uh, for investors who lose money in these things, there's a couple real big hurdles. Number one, these uh, these founder groups are almost never insured, at least not in the meantime. So you're not, there's not, there's no directors and officers uh, liability insurance or something like that to tap them generally. Okay, so you're looking at going after their actual individual assets. Okay. Um, now, if they did well enough in uh, in this ICO and actually reaped enough profits themselves from it, they, they might have some assets. But then you have the problem that most of the time they end up, uh, even if they were in the United States to begin with. They end up in the wind in Russia or Bulgaria or India or uh, or China or any number of places where it's going to be very very difficult to enforce uh, a United States judgment against them. Uh, I have several cases right now where we are actively pursuing enforcing judgments in overseas jur jurisdictions, and it is it's a long hard time. Uh, so. Uh, that, that's something to, to just be aware of uh, any time that you're, you're, you're looking at one, any, really any case. Even assuming that you win all the merits and you, uh, you get your class certified and you establish liability and you prove damages, you have to actually go after these people and find their money and get it and, uh, and enforce a judgment. And it's, it's very difficult. I've got uh, judgment enforcement efforts going on uh, in India, Singapore, uh, China. Ireland, uh, it, it, uh, Switzerland, it's it's th sort of a fabulous test. Um, what, in one of my cases, the, the, the cannabis uh, uh, company, um, the, 
the celebrity promoter of it was a rapper called The Game, if you've ever heard of him. Yeah, he's uh, a chart-topping rapper, uh, and uh, we got a uh, fall judgment against him for $12 million. But he, so he, but he's in this, this guy lives in California, and, uh, and you know, he's a record-topping artist. He has no assets in his name, it turns out. So we're, we're, it's, it's like chasing a ghost. Uh, so uh, while all this has been sort of very interesting intellectually, and I'm, I'm glad to have had an opportunity to help develop the law on it, uh, the remuneration part of it has been a little uh, disappointing. <laughs> you can't. Yeah. Is there any underwear liability you can pursue? Well, here's the thing. There are no underwriters. They didn't register. It's not registered. There is no underwriter. Yeah, these guys are just making this stuff up and, and uh, you know, creating this blockchain and uh, and uh, and making it up out of whole cloth. So there, you know, there is no Goldman Sachs underwriting, uh, or there is no just uh, distribution uh, um, a syndicate. Uh, there, there is no uh, registration uh, um, uh, uh, prospectus. It's just wild west, you know, and uh, and so uh, I, mean, I wish. Wouldn't it be great if Goldman Sachs had underwritten all these things? That'd be wonderful. I'd get all the money back from them because them I can find. <laughs> but uh, it turns out not so much. Uh, now, so as I mentioned, not all cryptocurrencies are going to be a security. After you go through that Howey analysis, not all of them are going to are going to be a security. Now, if they're not a security, what are they? Well, as I noted, uh, the CFTC has taken the position that Bitcoin and, and uh, Ethereum are commodities and subject to uh, the regulation under the Commodities Exchange Act. Uh, and in the matter of CoinFlip Inc., the, uh, the CFTC uh, uh, settled with the defendants. Uh, the order said that the individuals who had created a platform for the purchase and sale of Bitcoin options we're operating a facility for the trading or processing of swaps, uh, commodity swaps, without being registered uh, with uh, appropriately with the CFTC, and uh, thereby it violated the Commodity Exchange Act. Uh, and in doing so, the uh, the, uh, the CFTC found that the definition of a commodity is broad. Bitcoin and other virtual currencies are encompassed in that the definition and properly defined as commodities. So, generally speaking, if uh, if it's not a secured, chances are pretty good it's going to be a commodity. Okay, and again, that's a whole different set of of regulations and uh, and compliance requirements. But mostly, almost almost entirely, only on the trading and exchange level. Uh, there is no uh, C, uh, Commodity Exchange Act provision for the creation of a commodity. You know, commodities generally, you know, come out of the ground or off a tree or, uh, or, or what have you. Uh, the, uh, these uh, uh, ICO coins are just created out of thin air, uh, and so there uh, there really is no analogous CEA provision to. Section five of the Securities Act of 1933. I have two more minutes. Okay, there is, there is no analogous provision there. So if you can get it termed as a commodity, you can at least sell it. But then the the, the question becomes, well, if how are people going to exchange it afterwards? Uh, and uh, again, uh, what if once a, a, a platform tries to become essentially a broker? Uh, facilitating uh, trans uh, transactions, trading these things, uh, they're going to uh, need to take a real close look at, uh, at the CFTC regs and the Commodity Exchange Act. And then, uh, if it's not a security or commodity, maybe it's a currency, right? But the re reality is uh, that, for the most part, these cryptocurrencies, ironically, don't really fit the definition of security because they aren't primarily a medium of exchange. Uh, they're so volatile that, uh, that it's very hard to, uh, to use them as a reliable medium of exchange. You don't know what they're going to be worth from one day to the next. Uh, and even Bitcoin is, uh, 
the, the most prominent and widely used uh, cryptocurrency is likely to be classified as a currency for two reasons. First, as I noted, the, uh, the price volatility. And second, uh, because of that limited capacity that I mentioned earlier. And, and it's worth noting that the number of companies that you can transact business with in, uh, using even Bitcoin or Ethereum uh, is vanishingly small. For example, it's not like you can buy uh, uh, something on Amazon using Ethereum or, or Bitcoin. Uh, I do believe Tesla has made noise about allowing you to, uh, to buy uh, Tesla cars using cryptocurrencies, but I would regard that as an Elon Musk uh, gimmick, for want of a better word, rather, rather than a, um, uh, a, a real port of that thing. Yeah, you know, uh, harbinger of things to come. John, do these violate the suitability standard that they're offered through broker dealers in the US? Well, I mean, given how, vol given, given how volatile they are, I mean, obviously the, suit the suitability requirements for a fiduciary in the context of a uh, 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 of a uh, you know a broker client relationship particularly where the broker ha has a uh, discretion over the account. Uh, that really varies from client to client, what their risk tolerances are, what, uh, what their goals are. Uh, but given the volatility of, uh, of these cryptocurrencies and the high, high likelihood of fraud or failure in the, sm excuse me, in the smaller or less well-known uh, uh, cryptocurrencies, uh, I would be extremely reluctant if I was a broker dealer to be anything other than a passive uh, uh, facilitator of transactions. My other question was if the central banks create their own digital currency, as you're talking about doing, is the expectation that Bitcoin and Ethereum will drop you know, significantly in value and use? I'll be honest with you, I have no idea. Uh, you know, what makes these markets move in any given direction? It has no rhyme or reason that I can tell. It, it, it's, you know, it's sort of like watching starlings fly. You know, starlings fly in those massive um, flocks and, and sort of follow each other. And you, you always wonder how they follow each other uh, so in such perfect unison. <laughs> That's how, uh, how uh, cryptocurrency investors seem to be and, uh, and equally unpredictable. I, I, I honestly couldn't tell you. Uh, for, for example, Mark Zuckerberg was talking about creating a, a new cryptocurrency sort of surrounding Facebook. And uh, that didn't really seem to move the market for any of the other cryptocurrencies very much. And I believe Zuckerberg has since abandoned that idea. So it, it, who knows? Last quick note, once, once something, it, uh, once the cryptocurrency is classified as a, uh, as a security, uh, those uh, uh, the Section 11 and Section 12 requirements of the, 30, uh, of the 33 Act come into play, and anybody who was, was selling those in that initial offering uh, is potentially on the hook for for full refunds of the amounts invested in a strict liability setting. So that, that's that's the, uh, the impact of that. Um, and uh, last note, um, the uh, I did get through nearly everything I wanted to talk about today, but uh, that, that's the nature of one the time. Um, one the last thing I'll note is that the, the Biden administration did issue uh, a new uh, 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 executive order in March concerning uh, how the United States government is going to uh, regulate and interact with uh, cryptocurrencies. And it's mostly uh, a, a, a set of orders directing the government to research it more, learn more, and uh, come up with a plan, a comprehensive plan of how to regulate and use these things. Number one, to discourage them to be used to facilitate fraud. An awful lot, it turns out, an awful lot of cryptocurrency transactions are actually underpinned by, uh, by illegal activity. Uh, including you know, cross-border drug sales, things of that nature. Uh, but uh, I think it's fair to say that, that this 
new executive order is mostly uh, the Biden administration saying, hey, we need to learn more about this and come up with a comprehensive plan for how, how to deal with it going forward, because right now we don't have that. So it, it's more a matter of, of perspective, we need to do something about this rather than actually doing something about it. And I think that, that's about my time. I hope, I hope